Okay, so we're in uh, whatever week this is of this uh, different lifestyle that we've had to come to accept. Uh, but we are thankful that for the most part we're still uh, not suffering directly from uh, the COVID-19 crisis except for uh, some relatives that, that don't live here. But uh, we do keep them in our minds and, and all the others in our number who have suffered losses. Uh, we've just had an unusual number of deaths. So we want to keep in mind that this is, uh, it's always a serious situation. People, uh, people are always dying. This life is not uh, a permanent one, uh, but our life is a permanent one because it, this life is only a part of it. So we're happy to be together today, whether uh, outdoors at the church building or online. And uh, we want to um, be mostly grateful and thankful that we can. You probably noticed that our culture has come to worship celebrity and reality shows, so-called reality shows, are mostly just showing that people will do almost anything to be a celebrity. Um, in a church, do we generally consider, who do we generally consider to have the most wisdom and understanding? Well, it's elders and preachers, right? They're sort of the celebrities within churches, and there are actually celebrity preachers as well uh, on a broader basis. But it's partly right that uh, those who have the most wisdom and understanding, uh, you would think that elders and preachers would at least be among those in a church. Uh, what I mean is we shouldn't allow a person to lead or teach if they haven't shown some wisdom and understanding. Certainly no one is qualified to serve as uh, an elder or uh, a teacher in a church without that. But doesn't it seem that we sometimes are only showing respect for prominence when we think along these lines? Uh, what's more frightening is that people look to those who are prominent, those who are famous, as their examples. Uh, here are some quotes from some celebrities that they probably wish they could take back. Um, Britney Spears said, I've never really wanted to go to Japan simply because I don't like eating fish. And I know that's very popular out there in Africa. Uh, Christina Aguilera said, so where's the Cannes Film Festival being held this year? Uh, Jessica Simpson said, is this chicken or is this fish? I know it's tuna, but it says chicken of the sea. And then Brooke Shields said, smoking kills. If you're killed, you've lost an important part of your life. I'm sure that was when she was younger. Uh, she's gotten a little wiser since then, I'm sure. But um, uh, the only male I could find uh, that I wanted to include is the Dalai Lama, <laughs> believe it or not. And he said this, I mean, if a female Dalai Lama come, then she must be very attractive. Otherwise, not much use. Uh, I'm not sure where he's going with that, but quite often people will accept a movie star as an example, you know, whether it's even in politics or lifestyle. Um, you know, if Tom Hanks is gonna vote for Daffy Duck for president, we all want to do the same. If Tom Cruise believes in sex without responsibility, some people are gonna be influenced to, to believe the same way. Well, why is that? Because Tom Hanks knows all about politics, or is it because he's prominent? Well, see, it's all right to respect Richard Gere as an actor or to admire Tom Cruise for whatever talent God has given them, but just because they are prominent doesn't mean that they are wise and understanding. And Oprah is only the best of the worst, and saying that could get me into big trouble. But by the same token, just because a person is prominent in the church's activities, doesn't make him or her more wise and understanding than one who is less prominent. In fact, though James is telling us all how to develop a mature, complete faith, and the first thing he says is, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God and it will be given to him or her. It's a generic him. In chapters three and four, he plainly tells most of us though, not to seek prominence. So we're to seek wisdom, but not prominence. Well, spiritual maturity cannot be judged by leadership or teaching ability, 
uh, and we cannot all be teachers publicly, but we can all be mature in our faith. So one of the practical and helpful qualities of the book of James, as we've seen, is his clear definition of terms. For example, James defines religion that God accepts. He says religion that God accepts is love that motivates action. Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And last week we saw his definition of a living faith. A living faith are, is beliefs that motivate action, actions. Uh, and we saw this in, in uh, a longer passage in chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, but it's capsulized in verses 16 and 17. If any one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now in chapters 3 and 4, which we are coming to this week, James defines wisdom. Now there may be other kinds of wisdom, just as there are other kinds of religion and other kinds of faith, but James is telling us to seek the wisdom that comes from heaven. So in chapter 3, James simply tells us what not to do and what to do. And then in chapter 4, he'll do the same thing again with a little different slant, but we won't get to that today. So let's look at what not to do, first of all, uh, as it's laid out in chapter 3. And that is not to seek prominence. Do not seek prominence. James begins his thoughts with a rather striking statement and a warning in verse 1 of chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers. Now, I said this is a striking statement. What makes it striking? Well, it's striking to me in contrast with the emphasis that we tend to place on the spoken teaching when we talk about Christians or the Christian world. It's also striking when contrasted with the idea that we have that the ultimate Christian is an evangelist or a preacher. Well, let's keep our minds open for just a minute until we can take a look at the types of teaching opportunities that confront us today. But first, um, let's do a little more with the text itself. The original New International Version uh, translated this uh, uniquely, really, from most of the other versions. The literal translation is, not many of you should become teachers. Uh, that's what's in the current NIV. The older NIV says it this way, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Well, to presume is to behave with arrogance or without proper respect, to proceed with overconfidence or presumption. Uh, presumption is to be blind uh, or is a blind or, overwhelm, or overweening confidence or self-assertion. So when you think about it, isn't it really presumptuous of any person to think that he or she is worthy to lead people's minds in their search for truth, uh, especially when eternal salvation or damnation is riding in the balances. I mean, it seems to me that anyone who thinks that they are wise enough to do that is not showing proper respect for God. But some of us must be so presum presumptuous. Uh, that's just the fact. So let's just pray that we depend on God's word to do the guiding. But here's what James is really getting at. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. We all stumble in many ways. We all sin in many ways without being teachers, and we'll be lucky to be saved from those sins. So why add the judgment that God will have to make concerning your teaching? So the more you talk, the more likely you are to say something wrong. He says, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Now he's not saying that it doesn't matter how you live if you never say anything wrong. He's saying that the tongue is the last thing that you'll be able to get under control if you ever could. If you can control that, you can surely control the rest of your body. 
The tongue is small but powerful. James gives a series of analogies uh, to the nature of our tongues to make this point. Uh, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Now, though James's analogies are simple enough that we can all understand them, I do have a little additional experience with fires of my own, more than my parents would like to remember. Uh, they always started from one little match, but they sure did spread fast. Now, one of those fires was in uh, Harding Park near uh, Harding University, where a friend and I were just fighting little, uh, lighting little fires in the grass. And in the summertime in Arkansas, the grass would get as dry as it does here in California. And so we'd be lighting little fires and then just putting them out before they spread very far. Well, except this one. Uh, it began to spread a little bit further and we couldn't stomp it out. And my friend Bill ran across the street to Mr. Berryhill's house, my brother-in-law's uncle, to ask for some water to put it out. But Mr. Berryhill thought he wanted a drink of water and he invited him into the house. In the meantime, I was getting worried. So I ran home to get some water. And when I came back with my water, half of the park was black two or three acres, and I was there with a baby food jar full of water. <laughs> the only thing that stopped the fire was a little creek that ran through the park, um, all from one little match. Well, that's the way it is with our speech. Our tongue is the match. We think that we can just add a little spice to the conversation with it, and no harm will be done. So we'll just let it burn a little bit, but we'll stomp it out before it does any harm. So we light it just this once and tell a little story about someone. And we get everyone's attention, and it seems no harm is done. So we do it the next time. We want to have a little fun, and they always listen. Uh, Will Rogers said that the only time people dislike gossip is when you gossip about them. Uh, and then we find out that we can use our speech in other ways to get what we want. So we begin to say what people want to hear. Uh, we begin to exaggerate, maybe even lie. And so this fire has spread through our whole being to the point that we are thrown into the fire of hell, tongue and all. Uh, trying to stop the fire once it has begun to spread is as futile as trying to put out a grass fire with a baby food jar of water. It just gets out of control. Why is it that our speech is so hard to control? It isn't really the same as sensual pleasure. You know, I think there are two main reasons. Uh, one I've hinted at already, and that is that it seems relatively innocent. All right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, how stupid, you know, can anything be? We know better than that. They can hurt more than anything. The other reason it is so hard to control our tongues is because it takes so little effort. Think about it. Uh, all sins are conceived in the mind, and some thoughts are even sins themselves. But other than the sins of thought, those might be the easiest, <laughs> what other sin is as easy to commit as one of speech? I mean, <clears throat> murder certainly takes some effort, involves some risks. Um, uh, so does theft. Uh, illicit sex requires some groundwork, involves risks. Drunkenness costs time, money, and headaches afterwards. See, we can go on and on, but you get the point. Gossip is just such a convenient sin. Uh, you don't e usually even have to stop what you're doing in order to gossip. Angry words are harder to stop than to start. Another lie just seems to slip out. No man can tame the tongue. But go on to verses 9 through 12. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise 
and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We're sometimes so inconsistent and hypocritical in what we say. Uh, when you praise God, you're praising love, since God is love. Love is living for others. When you say something bad about someone, you do it for some selfish reason. There is no loving reason to destroy another person with your words. So Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, applying that truth to God and money, but it applies as well to God and self. And so let your tongue serve God. Use it for praising God and building others up and nothing else. It's been said that there are three tests that all words should pass before they pass our lips. Uh, are they true? Are they kind? Are they necessary? Uh, this is not a two out of three proposition. All three are required. But James says all of this about the tongue to emphasize the difficulty of being the one who talks all the time. Being the teacher, the preacher. How can a teacher be slow to speak and quick to listen, as James emphasized in chapter 1. Well, someone has to teach. James is using hyperbole to, to say you'd better not be teaching for the wrong reasons or it'll just get you into more trouble. So what do we do with the wisdom that God gives us? That wisdom that we prayed for. Shouldn't it be shared? Well, sometimes. But there's a better answer that comes out of James's definition of wisdom. And we'll get to that. But let's take James's main point to heart and think of seeking prominence as the overall answer as to what not to do. So, so much for what we shouldn't do. What should we do? Well, James answers, be humble. But humility is more than a feeling. Religion is more than religious expressions. Faith is more than intellectual beliefs. So show your wisdom and understanding by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Uh, look at verses 13 through 16. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you, <coughs> if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So you think you're wise, uh, so wise that you should teach. Well, maybe you're just power hungry. Again, think about it. Being a preacher or elder or teacher in a church can give you the best of both worlds. Uh, if you want to make sure you save yourself, but you don't want to give up your ego, you can have power and prestige and be the center of attention as a teacher or preacher or elder. You can make sure your ideas are heard. This comes from envy and selfish ambition, and that sort of ambition is worldly. The business world may respect the man who claws his way to the top, but that same spirit is not right for followers of Jesus. So why are there troubles between preachers and elders and other leaders of a church that is supposed to be the Lord's church to have only one head? Well, it's because some allow improper motives to take over. The wisdom that is from God doesn't produce selfish ambition. It produces humility. James is very explicit about where that kind of wisdom comes from. Uh, the kind that produces selfish ambition is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wisdom that comes from God does not make us more arrogant or conceited. It makes us more humble. I think this is really even true of scientific knowledge. The more that you know, the humbler you become because you see how much more there really is to learn. Those who are recognized as the most intelligent scientists quite often become more humble as they grow more knowledgeable. Uh, arrogant scientists or professors 
tend to stop learning at some point. Albert Einstein believed that humility was necessary for anyone to really learn. He was skeptical of a lot of religious beliefs, but it seems that his belief in God did grow with his knowledge of the universe. Uh, Aristotle is often quoted as saying, the more you know, the more you don't know. Uh, and, but he probably didn't actually say that. But Einstein uh, did apparently say something taken from that. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. The more you understand about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about the whole plan through which God has revealed himself to humanity and saved us, the less likely you are to overestimate your own worth. Let's turn that around and look at it from another direction. If you have a lot of pride in your wisdom and ability, then you've missed something. That wisdom is not from God because the wisdom that is from God produces humility. So how do we resolve the conflict between the need for leadership and the awesomeness of the responsibility connected with such leadership? Well, first of all, as an aside, let me say, this doesn't usually fit into the framework of children's teachers, children's classes. Not very many churches have divided because of fights over who should teach the children. In fact, it sometimes requires a lot of humility to use your talents and time in that way. People avoid it uh, because often very little gratitude is shown to you. It is isn't a position of prominence or power. Uh, however, if you teach children, you certainly should be aware of the awesome responsibility involved you're leading very impressionable minds in a growth toward a concept of God. And, you know, that's what he is like, what he wants us to be like. And so take your job seriously if you teach children because you are providing a real service, even if it's your own children, of course. The real problem usually comes with the positions of prominence, though. That usually happens only among those who are leading adults or who want to. Ego and selfishness can creep in and destroy us through our leaders. It stunts our growth. Whenever things are going really well, the devil finds one of us who is weak to get his ball rolling, and then we jump in there and play his game, and it all begins some conflict. So let's all resolve to never be involved in petty squabbles. After all, we're not going to be saved because we're right about what, we should, what should be done in matters to which the Bible does not speak directly. Uh, those same kinds of things that Paul meant when he talked about disputable matters uh, in Romans. What does God's wisdom address itself to? Human relationships. People getting along with each other. People loving each other. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What does he mean by wisdom being first of all pure? He means that we don't seek knowledge to use it for selfish purposes like the Pharisees in Jesus' day did, and like we can do when we think in terms of getting ahead. Peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere peacemakers. What do those qualities have to do with wisdom? Well, nothing at all if we're talking about the wisdom of the world, but everything if we're talking about wisdom from heaven. So what do we see in James's definition of wisdom? More action. He defines wisdom as humility that motivates action. So let's use our genius, our ingenuity, to find ways to love more humbly and more effectively. Let's pray once again to be like Jesus as we remember him as we take the bread. Our Father, we are so thankful that you uh, just keep reaching out to us to come down to our level so that we can finally understand things that, that we are really not very well equipped uh, at times to understand because of the, the fights that go on within our spirits and sometimes even outside with others. Father, we pray that we will look to Jesus 
uh, for wisdom, that we will see that by giving his life, by giving his body, uh, that was evidence of the humility that comes from wisdom. He knew that we needed that more uh, than anything else, and he was willing to provide it and could provide it, and therefore did provide it. Help us to have the same spirit and attitude and take actions in the same way when we see others who need our bodies in whatever way uh, we may need to serve them. Pray these things in Jesus' name as we take this bread. Amen. And let's think also of what he did uh, when he gave his blood that this cup represents. Our Father, we are so thankful that, that Jesus uh, was willing to let his side be pierced, to let his back be whipped, uh, to let thorns be put on his, his head, and that that blood that, that came from all of those sites uh, and the spear that was pierced especially, uh, that we know that he gave up his life for us, and because he did that, uh, his spirit was set free to be given uh, then by him to us, and we pray that we will allow that spirit to take over our own so that we can truly develop the wisdom uh, that comes from you and not from our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you will have another good week and that we will see one another in one form or fashion. Uh, have a good one.